Hello everybody, I'm doing this late at night so that I don't get disturbed by the phone, the doorbell, etc, etc and people. Now this talk is called Differences in Prophecy and I want to talk about the role of Antiochus Epiphanes and the Apocalypsmatic Principle and, you know, what did it really mean that Des had these differences in prophecy? I don't really think it meant the hill of beans, except that it gave, would have given the church a biblical basis, but they could have retained some of their ideas. And I talk a little bit about Glacier View just briefly, and there'll be a bit in there about righteousness by faith, but the emphasis on this one is we'll see how we go because I re rearranged these today and I'll find out whether I did a reasonable job. So where did Des's prophetic differences begin? Well, as a young child in his early teens, he was fascinated by Uriah Smith's Daniel and Revelation, great controversy, and all the charts. Um, his great controversy was very much marked, um, covered with circles and lines and things written, and he knew knew these things backwards. And we all know that Des had a wonderful memory, and a lot of things he knew by heart. He used to be able to outquote his enemies because he knew Ellen White much better than they did. So when he read Great Controversy, we all know that there are two chapters on the sanctuary in there, but Des was fascinated by Ellen White's later comments on the Hindra and the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, you remember that Arthur and Esme Branner were interviewed by Peter Dixon and as part of firing Arthur, Mark Finley, the evangelist, told the Branners that 1844 was the last prophetic date. Well, you know, the, the final appearance, I'm just going to move this, get the light a little bit better, it just doesn't make sense to say that 1844 was the last prophetic date. What about the appearance of the man of sin, the final Antichrist? I guess what they mean is there was no date for that. And Des's thesis at Manchester, his considered the, the part on the Hindra and the restrainer and, and the man of sin, was considered his contribution to knowledge by Professor F.F. F. Bruce. And Des says... He used the arguments of Ellen White around in the 600s, somewhere in Great Controversy. And he doesn't know where she got them from. 2 Thessalonians 2 is considered a crux interpretum, which is a difficult passage. And many scholars have had views about what it might mean. And somehow Ellen White made what is called a gestalt you know, that had different facets, including all these different ideas that came from outside scholars. So Des was impressed, and so was F.F. F. Bruce. But of course, Des couldn't quote Ellen White, but that's where he got it, from, got it from. And this was new to the evangelists, but they didn't realise Des got it from Ellen White. Now Des saw that the final picture of the Antichrist was bigger than just the Catholic Church. Many of the evangelists could not get past the Catholics and their antagonism to Catholicism was what got them hunting down Des in the beginning. So Des was saying that future ideas about prophecy could include pagan Rome and papal Rome as we always had, but our view of the future Antichrist was not just about Catholics, it was a much 
bigger issue. That could have included Catholics, um, but it wasn't going to be just then. Talking about the investigative judgment, this is the Adventist version of hell. I've just read an article written by Wolf Pascoe on how we've taught, as a denomination, we've taught sanctification wrongly. And I'll address this a little bit. Um, and young people who sought to be perfect have found it so difficult. And he mentions a number of them that have suicided. There ought to be an outrage over this. The church ought to be brought to task. There ought to be committees saying, what are we teaching that brings some of our young people to suicide? You know, I'm sure it's not massive numbers and people in any population will suicide. But in these cases, as Wilfred pointed out, these young people suicided because they couldn't live perfect lives. And that's, that's a crime to teach that, that you can. So the investigative judgment <clears throat> is the SDA version of hell. We're under intense scrutiny 24 hours a day and perfection is the quest. And you might be saved at some point, but if you have any unconfessed sins when you die or if you fail, you cannot go to heaven. <clears throat> probation closes but we're still on probation because we've got to live without a mediator the Holy Spirit is withdrawn only from the wicked in reality it's not biblical that the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from believing Christians the last judgment that's the time the only time that our sins are going to be blotted out and this is why Bob Brinsmead, in his old view, made it a divine and supernatural work. He saw that man could not be perfect. But often we're not teaching it in classes. Uh, and yet at the top, it's the benchmark, the standard by which many ministers are fired. And it's still happening. And people like me, I was brought into the church in 1966. My minister never raised the investigative judgment with me. I knew nothing about it. And so because it's difficult and post questions on doctrine when many mis uh, ministers had a better view of the Bible, not perfect but better, a lot of people have come into the church knowing nothing about it. My friend Gail Mason she talks to all the people who are mainly old people at her church in South East Queensland and none of them have heard of the investigative judgment. So we might talk about it, scholars, and differ and argue about it and bring people like Des to trial and fire them over it. But the common people, many of them don't have a clue and that's wrong. And we know you know, Des used to feel embarrassed about going to Avondale in the days after Glacier View. But before he died, he felt so much better about it because so ministers, many ministers said to him, we don't believe it. But they can't say it because if they say it, they get fired. And Bob Brinsmead said, it's as though the prodigal son comes home and is on probation. That's what Adventism teaches, but I'll come back to that. And our view of the investigative judgment undermines the gospel. In reality, our sins are cast into the depths of the sea and we see them no more. That's what happens when we believe in the cross, but it's not what Adventism teaches. Now, according to Bob Brinsmead, and he, he has spent a lot of time, this is a recent statement, but he spent a lot of time being on the traditional side of Adventism, looking at the Reformation view, and he got sick of religious argument, argumentation. He worked with 
different groups in the Christian church apart from Adventism and he concluded that all they wanted was to promote their special doctrines. They weren't interested in the salvation of the unwashed. They just weren't. It was basically promoting their own ideas and looking after themselves, which is a terrible thing. So according to Bob, he said, the pioneers, such as Uriah Smith, who really, his ideas have been kept above Ellen White's. He's been favoured by a lot of the traditionalists who have favoured his ideas in Daniel and Revelation in the chapters in Great Controversy, which were largely written by Uriah Smith and J.N. Andrews. And Uriah Smith taught that the atonement was incomplete. So your sins were not blotted out at the cross. It was a partial forgiveness. You could lose it at any time. You had to maintain obedience. You had to maintain works. And at his ascension, Jesus entered the most the sanctuary, I've got the most heav heavenly sanctuary, but I don't mean that. He enters the heavenly sanctuary to intercede for us, like the Catholic priests in the Mass. With him he takes our polluted blood into the holy place. Yet in the Bible, blood never pollutes. It always cleanses. So we're on probation, and we can't have any assurance. We hope that one day we might have eternal life. There are ministers who are traditional who teach this. You can't have assurance until the judgment is complete, the final blotting out of sins. So many have died without the assurance of salvation. And yet the book of John continually says, we may know that we are the children of God, blah, blah, blah. We can know that we've got Salvation. In 1844, Jesus moves into the most holy place and begins a work of investigative judgment. And investigative judgment is a word, there is actually a phrase for this, but I can't remember it. It's the same as saying free gift. All judgments are investigated. Well, sometimes they're judgments where the person is not guilty, so that's different. But they are investigating. It's the same as saying free gift. We talk about the gospel and we say it's a free gift. It's like saying it's a gift gift. It's a form of emphasis. So Jesus is going through our through the sins of the dead and he's going to move from the dead to the living at any point. We don't know when. And we don't know when our case will come up. And all this violates Romans 3, where it says that salvation is not of works, but of faith. And the fact is that the real investigative judgment was on the cross and on Christ, not on us. And with the investigative judgment, what Des said was, you can rehash it as many modern scholars have and they've called it good news and full of assurance because a group at the end of time are going to vindicate God by their sanctification and that is heresy it's absolute heresy but Des says what's wrong about the investigative judgment is the dates and the date setting the date 1844 and all the other dates in the 2,300 dates, they're all wrong. First of all, we look at, I think it's Acts 1-7, it's not for you to know the dates. So we shouldn't be doing it anyway. And as you used to say, Jesus was the last word. We're not supposed to be setting dates after, after Jesus died. He was the fulfilment of prophecy. In 24 years, it's going to be 200 years since the investigative judgment started. Is Jesus bad at arithmetic? Is he a poor accountant? Doesn't he have a computer? I.e. He's very slow taking time to assess 
our sins. The very passage of time shows the doctrine of the investigative judgment is not true. The beginning date cannot be 457. Now, Roy Gain thinks he can prove it is. And Andre Rice said that it's all, what he's saying is old-fashioned and out of date, and it's not right. And Des said it's more likely to be 538, but that date doesn't lead to 1844. There is no scriptural evidence that the week and the six, the, the week and the 69 weeks are joined together in order to calculate 1844, and the date of the baptism and the cross are both unreliable. Now people are down on Des because he taught the apotelismatic principle and George McCready Price, who traditional believers love because he was against evolution. A lot of his information was not factual, but he was highly regarded in his day. And he believed, he mentions the apotelismatic principle. It wasn't devised by Des. He read it in Moses Stewart, who wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, in I think in the 1800s, a very old book, and he got it from German scholars. And all it means is that the principles of both good and evil recur through the ages and will get increasingly worse until they end in the final Antichrist and the end of all things. That's all it means. Now, Ellen White used dualism, for instance, with Joel too, where it was applied to the time of Joel. It was also applied to the day of Pentecost. And she used Matthew 24 on the encircling of Rome after the cross. But it's also applied to the second coming. But Ger Gerhard Hausel said, you can't use it in apocalyptic books. I must ask you, why? Who said so? So when we were in class, I was in Des's Daniel class in 1966, he used like a dartboard, an expanding circle, based on Daniel 2. The image was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Pagan Rome, Papal Rome. So the dartboard goes out and each one got these different names. But others believe that the image is different, that it's Babylon, Media, Persia and Greece, and they leave Rome out and end up with the Syrian puppet king, Antiochus Epiphanes. And I've got two charts here. So you can see the Adventist chart with the usual thing, the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, the chest and arms of Medo-Persia, the belly of bronze was Greece, the legs of iron were Rome, the feet and the toes were sort of Europe, and then the rock was Jesus. So that's the Adventist chart. So here's the other chart. So now I've got to do that all again. So the head of gold is Babylon. Silver is Medo-Persia. Greece is the bronze. Well, that's different than what I told you. Yeah, that's right. And then the thighs, the hips and thighs are the king of the north, the Syria Seleucid Empire. That's what Antiochus comes out of. And the king of the south is Egypt and the Ptolemaic Empire. Now, if you look at, at Wikipedia, at Daniel 2 on Wikipedia, it'll give you a nice article about this and it will tell you what the Adventists believe the Mormons believe and the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. I didn't get that far down. But people have, have different views on it. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes. Des is always accused of taking the preterist view. And all the preterist view means is, it's what the Bible meant to the people in their day. He didn't take that view. 
that Antiochus Epiphanes was the fulfilment of the little horn in Daniel 8.14. He rather said that Antiochus Epiphanes was the archetype of evil to the Jews of the time. He sacrificed a pig, he sacrificed pigs in the temple, he sacrificed Jews on the altar, he nearly wiped them all out. He certainly was big to the Jews. We may not think much of him, but they wrote the book. He was the manifestation of, of evil to them. But Des would say it, Daniel 8.14 wasn't filled full by Antiochus. He was merely a prototype of evil. Now, in the 1919 Bible Conference, which has been talked about, Spectrum came out with it, I can't remember now, but it was quite a while ago, decades ago. It was sort of lost and then found. And in it, a man called Lacey, can't remember his first name, mentioned Antiochus, and apparently Ellen White agreed. So Des wasn't new on this. The pioneers knew about it. I said to Des once, why is the addition of Antiochus Epiphanes a problem for Adventists? And he said because it downplayed Rome as the interpretation. And of course Adventists liked Luther, as I mentioned before, because he hated the Catholics rather than because he preached the Gospel. Des always said the Catholic Church is only the beast when it persecutes, not in times of peace. And of course, with the sexual abuse of its children, it's certainly persecuting its own. So we're looking at the differences in ideas with Des and the denomination. So Des was saying the end time scenario was bigger than the Catholics. And Adventists might miss what was going on if they only look for Catholics. And the apotelismatic principle was just a way of helping Adventists reinterpret and re-express their past in a way that was more biblical. The Glacier View manuscript was an expression of the errors in the denomination's prophetic views. And Des's solutions were only suggested. Maybe he didn't make it clear. Alton Thompson said oh, he didn't know that. But you've got to remember, Des had no freedom to really say what he wanted to do. We were both told not to speak at Glacier View. And he was put in a situation where he was aggressively asked questions. Um, it was no sinecure. He'd rather been on the beach. But when it came, a lot of the scholars did agree with Des that there were problems. It's been known from the beginning of the denomination. And some ministers who've made it public, they've been picked off by snipers from the beginning. Um, but the scholars at Glacier View, while some of them did agree with Des's recitation of the problems, didn't give him any other solutions for him to change his mind on. He said to me, they gave me nothing. Nothing. And Des said to me before he died, I didn't go to Glacier View to change my mind. I'd done the work. I needed evidence to change my mind on my solutions, not the problems. And I was given nothing, as I've mentioned. So, the areas of disagreement. Des believed in a, Luther a Lutheran Reformation view of righteousness by faith, taught in the book of Romans. It saw Jesus as the eschaton. And the last judgment of the world took place at the cross for those who accepted his sacrifice by faith. So people are saved by Christ's works not their own. As far as righteousness by faith, the denomination has traditionally taught perfectionism, that there will be a final generation who keep the law perfectly 
and thus vindicate God at a time when they believe the Holy Spirit is withdrawn. Now, in the time of the 70s and 80s, Kenneth Wood and Herb Douglas, the Standish brothers and many, many people were teaching about this final generation. And it's still true today. There are many ministers who, when they talk to each other, they don't believe in the investigative judgment. They don't believe it's, it's biblical. Um, but, you know, I could name people, and even the General Conference president cur currently believes in this final generation thing. So it's how can a church go ahead when it's so severely divided on something that matters so much and causes some people to suicide? Anyway, the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith erases the need for an 1844 investigative judgment. Now, a little bit about the investigative judgment for people who don't know much about it. And I'm one of them. So you need to check what I say. I've studied a lot to do these slides, but, you know, I might have got it wrong. It's a unique Adventist doctrine that the judgment of professed Christians began October 22, 19, in 1844. And it was developed after William Miller's prediction that Jesus was coming on that failed Fa that failed date. The idea was formed 13 years later in 1857 and it teaches as I mentioned that Jesus entered in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary at his ascension at the high, as the high priest of humanity taking the sins of the saints polluted blood with him and the texts used are Daniel 7, 9 to 10, Matthew 22, 1 to 14, 1 Peter 4, 17, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, Revelation 20, 12. The 2,300 days in Daniel 8, 13 and 14 become 2,300 days years using the year day principle found in Ezekiel and Numbers in the Old Testament. So 2,300 days converted to 2,300 years by the year day principle which Des questioned and a lot of other people and they're said to have started in 457 and ended on the 22nd of October 1844. The date 457 is questionable. The 70-week period in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, is held to begin in 457 BC, the seventh year of Artaxerxes. The 2,300 evenings and mornings is held to commence the same year. And the 2,300 days, as I mentioned, correspond to 2,300 years. I've repeated that. And the works of all men and women, written down in books of record, kept in heaven. These were opened after 1844, the dead and the living. So people don't know when their case comes up. So as a response to that, as I've mentioned, it's not for you to know the dates. In 24 years, I've mentioned this, it's going to be 200 years since the investigative judgment started. Is Jesus bad at arithmetic? It's taking a long time to assess our sins. The 2,300 days is day, is morning, evenings. <clears throat> and this is the language of two sacrifices a day. So many consider it's 15 hundred days, not 2,300. 
There's no scriptural evidence that the week and the 69 years are joined together in order to calculate 1844. And the other things on that slide I've already mentioned. So here's a couple of statements, typical statements, probably from great controversy. I didn't put, put it down for some reason. The forgiveness of sins is future. Maybe. That's my head. All who have truly repented of sin and by faith claim the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice have had pardon entered against their names in the book of heaven. As they have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ and their characters are found to be in harmony with the law of God, their sins will be blotted out and they themselves will be accounted worthy of eternal life. This is at the end of time. On the other hand, when any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven, their names will be blotted out of the book of life. The record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance. It's terrible stuff. Sins that have not been repented of and forsaken will not be pardoned and blotted out of the books of record, but will stand to witness against the sinner in the day of God. Can't you see how contrary that is to the Gospel in Romans 3? It's diametrically opposed. Whereas in the Bible, John 5.24, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. It gives me the goosebumps. Those who by faith accept the cross pass through judgment when they believe and as long as they believe. Judgment is always for the saints and against the wicked. Blood cleanses, it never pollutes. The dates are all wrong. 2,300 evening mornings are 1150 days. No scripture to prove that the 70 times 7 and the 2,300 days start at the same time. We can have assurance that if we're right with Christ today, we'll be right when Jesus comes. But in the Adventist view of salvation, as I've mentioned, we're on probation. Uriah Smith spoke of an incomplete atonement that we're not fully forgiven. We're on probation till our sins are blotted out from the final judgment. Um, there's a lot of focus in the 19th century on, the on double ledger bookkeeping. It was a bit of a fad and Ellen White liked this idea. So she had the credits and the debits and God was the divine accountant settling up our sins. So a lot of the idea for this came out of that. In 1844, the judgment of the dead and living begins. As I've mentioned, you never know when your case is coming up. When probation closes, the Holy Spirit is withdrawn and believers have to live without a mediator. They have no assurance. We hope we might have salvation in the end. In the latter days, the sanctification of the saints vindicates God and it undermines justification by faith. Now, some of those slides were repetitive. Sorry about that, but I don't think it hurts. Because you've got to see the difference. Now, the basic problem in Adventism, in my thinking, is this idea of Wesleyan sanctification. We didn't just come from Wesley, because our ideas on millennialism and date setting came from the Calvinists in Europe who went over to America, persecuted and took date-setting with them. So apart from, calling, <coughs> apart from calling justification by faith antinomianism, the main history in Adventism is Wesleyan perfectionism. The definition in Wikipedia, in Wesley's theology, entire sanctification was a work of grace received by faith that removed inbred or original sin. And this allowed the Christian to enter a state of perfect love 
Love Excluding Sin, has stated in the sermon, The Scriptural Way of Salvation. So Christian perfection is the name given to various teachings within Christianity that describes the process of achieving spiritual maturity or perfection. The ultimate goal of this process is union with God, characterised by pure love of God and other people, as well as personal holiness or sanctification. Various terms have been used to describe the concept, such as Christian holiness, entire sanctification, perfect love, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, the second blessing, and the second work of grace. So that's an important idea. Wesley, if you look up Christian perfection, that's where that information comes from. And it's at the root of the problem of Adventism. And the problem with it, it's not only the right-wingers who were tarred with this. A lot of scholars think we're Wesleyan and that we should go along with his ideas. But Wesley, on sanctif- he was correct on justification by faith, but he was incorrect on sanctification. And so, so was Ellen White. For much of, you know, for her early days anyway. She was never completely clear. So last generation theology well, is heresy, the idea that God will be vindicated in the latter days by his people is a heresy because the God-man vindicated himself at the cross. God doesn't need us to vindicate him. God help him if he does. He makes such a mess of everything. Adventists have made a timeline and forgotten that the cross is at the beginning and end of history. We've turned, is the cross in, the, in, in history, and we've turned it up and made the cross salvation history. That's where it's at. <clears throat> and last generation theology and Christian perfection, it's a focus on what we have to do versus what God has done. So what was the reason for Glacier View? Des was pushed to Glacier View by two streams of people. One, the concerned brethren, mainly pastors and evangelists, who taught the old views. They had him brought down to the division in the 1970s three times. A new president came in after we left the USA. The CBs had more meetings. I believe there were 120 at one of them, but I'd want to check that. The new president, a man called Keith Parmenter, went to Glacier View and insisted that Desby dealt with that week. And the second group, stream of people, who pushed Des to Glacier View was Bob Brinsmead and his followers. Bob Brinsmead was a gadfly on the side of the denomination. He was originally perfectionistic and caused a lot of dissent in Australian and American churches. He switched his view on the gospel around in 1970 and became a teacher of Lutheran Reformation belief in righteousness by faith. Des saved the Australasian division from Brinsmead's teachings in the 1960s. He was later accused of colluding with him in the 1970s and 1980s. And his brother John went down and talked to Elder Parmenter in the late 70s, contacted him a number of times, told him a number of things about Des and I that were fictional. This was part of the means of firing Des. And neither of us were ever told about the background of the accusations. We ultimately found it out from Bob Brinsmead and from others who knew about it. So in late 1978, Bob was, he became interested in the gospel in 1970 and he was looking at 1844 and the doctrine of the investigative judgment. And he was on a visit in America. He went up the coast and stayed with Heffenstall and later came up to see us. And I've got a vague memory of it, although Des doesn't, didn't remember it. Uh, and he said that he broached the investigative judgment with first Heppenstall and then Des, and neither of them were willing to tackle it. And so Bob went back to Australia 
he wrote a book and it was published in July 1979 called 1844 Reexamined. And uh, I've mentioned before my first lot of slides that around that time in summer 1979 Des was writing Crisis and he went to Washington DC, handled most of the commentaries on Revelation, some of them very ancient, the early centuries and also around the Reformation and Des could see that, that in each age people had read the book of Revelation like a newspaper and applied it to their times and that Adventists had done the same thing. So he came home and told me about it and it clarified things for Des. He'd known about these problems for a long time. But it crystallised in his mind. Shortly after that, probably within a month, he was asked to take the October 27, 1979 forum in order to respond to Bob Rinsmead. And Des was reluctant, he said he'll open up a can of worms, but he was told he'd be protected by forum. So he took the meeting, was actually, he told the people the problems, and he told them the solutions. And Graham Bradford said Des was trying to help the church because what they were teaching was not biblical. And he had come up with a way that could have helped them where they could have, you know, preached their ideas in a biblical way. But, of course, they weren't interested. Anyway, he was told that he would be protected by forum, and of course he wasn't. So he was called out of class immediately and sent to Washington and given six months study leave. Now the Glacier View manuscript, the original was three volumes, 991 pages, I believe. And Des wrote a large document because he wanted to last for all time and cover all arguments. It's like doing a PhD thesis in less than six months. In April 1980, you have the production at the Dallas GC of the Dallas Statement of 27 Fundamentals. Now that had been planned and worked on in committee for 18 months. So it occurred before the October Forum. However, it was somewhat rushed through, I believe, I can't be positive, but Neil Wilson sort of suggested that in order to have something to act as a benchmark in order to, to deal with death. So the Dallas Statement, 27 Fundamentals, was put together and when you read Larry Geraghty's history it was a bit of a mishmash. Anyway, they came up, Glacier View was about number 23 which after a later edition of A Fundamental on Creation, which was a, a real disaster, became number 24. So Glacier View was held in a uh, campground in Colorado in early August 1980, and it took place over a week, from Sunday to Sunday, really. We left on the following Sunday. There was a group of 115 Adventist world administrators and scholars at Glacier View who were there for other meetings the following week. Now, we were told to keep quiet in the meetings, that the manuscript was Des's contribution. There were small study groups that Des was not part of for four meetings, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The group notes, they had team leaders and secretary and something else. The group notes in response to questions were collated and put together as the consensus statement. One on the Bible, one on Ellen White, but they were called, well they're sometimes called the consensus documents, sometimes called the consensus statements and sometimes singular and sometimes plural. But the chapter was Christ in the Heavenly Sanctuary was the biblical one. And you can find it published in ministry, I think it's September 1980. 
Now, while we were there in the background, really not part of the meeting, and probably from the Tuesday on, Neil Wilson chose six people. Two of them were desert students, which was a, a clever touch, um, to put together this statement. Did I say it was a 10-point statement? And that was called... I think it was called Desmond Ford's statement in the Ministry magazine. So one of the confusions is that these statements, you know, you've got the Dallas statement, well, that was over before Glacier View, and then the consensus statements has got a different title, and the 10 point statement, which was called something different in the Ministry as well. So it is confusing. But the 10 point statement was basically these scholars put together one or more uh, areas where Des differed in his manuscript to the Dallas Statement. And in, I've told you before somewhere else that in Neil Wilson's mind, um, the Dallas Statement and the traditional view were the same thing, just cultural and linguistic changes to make it more modern. It's quite clear at Dallas, that they're not going to change. So on the Friday morning, we were called to meetings. Well, I haven't done the Friday morning. I missed something out, but I can do this bit from memory. The Friday morning, we had a full assembly. A lot of people had left. Heaven's Stall had left. There was a young African man. I talked to through the week, he was very intelligent and progressive and he thought there was big change and just before he left on Thursday he came to me and he said it's hopeless, mainly because of the reading out of Pearson's letter on the Thursday afternoon, which was a horrible letter and very unfactual and unfair. This was never given a copy, although we got one afterwards somehow. Um, what not permitted to respond to it, not permitted to respond publicly to the consensus statements. And being as it was a consensus of the whole group, including Des, he should have, as Des's daughter, Len, pointed out, he should have been able to stand in front of the group and say what he thought of the consensus statement. But they didn't want him to do that because he thought it was pretty good. He told them he could live with it. it. wasn't perfect, but there were some major changes, things that we'd never said before in the consensus statements. Des was surprised and happy with it, but the, bre the leaders made sure that he didn't get to say that publicly. So the consensus statement I've mentioned elsewhere it was copied, everybody had a copy in their hands of those who were there, and it was read from the front, everybody followed along, questions and answers, so there were slight changes made, and just turned to me and said, this is, this is great, I can live with it, and he obviously told other people. And again, I've mentioned this elsewhere. And then at four o'clock in the afternoon, Des and I were called to a meeting with Prexad, not a huge group, but from that's the highest committee in the church, and two members of the Australasian division, so uh, Keith Parmenter and Arthur Duffy were there. Arthur Duffy is a lovely man. Um, when I not well, I won't go into me. I cried. It was quite overwhelming, and I left. But I came back again, and I heard the most important stuff. And as I've mentioned, I also have the notes of Spangler and others about the Friday afternoon. And there were a number of criticisms of Des. He was divisive, he was arrogant, he didn't listen. They apparently said he leaked the document, which, as far as leaking it to copy it, was not true. Then they talked quite a lot about Bob Brinsmead and the collusion and how he'd agreed with Bob to let him send out 50,000 tapes. And I've told you that this was fictional. I did a, his, a historical study 
in 2000, but 27 years later, and to my surprise, I found out it wasn't true. We thought it was true. Des was quite happy about it, that all these tapes had gone out. It wasn't true. And they didn't put that figure in the notes. They kept me pretty much out of the ministry. There's a slight mention. So most people at Glaciaview have no idea how big a topic, topic Brinsmead was. And I remember Elder Bradford urging Des to bend to the brethren. That was the whole focus of the meeting. And they wanted him to, well, Parminder said, you can't just pocket your ideas. You've got to change your mind and state in the review that you're wrong and you have to teach the traditional view. That's what Des was told. He was also told that he must publish against Bob Brinsmead in the, in the review. And this is why Des didn't have any choice. We prayed about the meeting and Des said, I don't want to leave Adventism unless I absolutely can't stay in. But the options that they gave him, Des couldn't accept. And they said, we'll give you two weeks. And Des said, you could give me, I don't know how long, 100 years, a 1,000 years, he said, I could never do it. He said, Bob Brinsmead is preaching the gospel and he's a fellow brother. And I, they found that very hard to believe. And it was clear that they would have done it to keep their job. But Des couldn't do it. And I've mentioned, sort of before this, they read out the 10-point statement and Des said, well, I'll read it. So it was just a small page, 10 points, no biblical evidence. When you see it in the ministry, it's several pages long. So they padded it out. And remember, Des, uh, it, obviously it was clear to Des how they were going to fire him using the 10-point statement. And I... I don't know whether I'm matching this, but I remember seeing him accept it as from the Lord, that this is what they were going to do. And he was perfectly calm about it. But he said to them, there's no biblical evidence in it. And Bob Spangler said, well, by the time we publish it in the ministry, there will be, which shows it was all pre <laughs> And uh, they said, well, I hope, and I would have said this before, but um, I hope that I'd see it before it goes out for publication. And Spangler promised he would. And I always had a grievance against him until in 1983 I told him. And he said that he'd forgotten. And what they did was they took Des off the mailing list. And anyway, he was fired before the ministry came out. So... He never saw the altered copy. So, and then of course somebody gave the throwaway comment, this is still in the Friday afternoon, what do you think of the consensus statement? And I think it was Francis Wernick. I can't be absolutely sure. And Des said, I think it's great. I can live with it. It's gone towards my views in 12 points, some of, seven of them key. And he said, it's come a long way. Within a few years, it'll go the rest of the way. <laughs> of course, they didn't like that. And after that, I've mentioned how Keith Parmenter said he talked to Lance Butler and he talked about we'd get money for our fares to go back to Australia and we'd get some month's wages. And I thought they fire were firing him because he'd said, please don't plead with us anymore. They kept begging him and... He said, please don't please with me anymore. So then we get to talk about severance pay. And at the end, Keith Parmenter came up and a little smile on his face. And he said, I'd offer you, says, I'd offer you a job in the SHF, but I know it wouldn't suit you. And I was rebuked. Pastor Parmenter called me aside and said that I'd given out false information. And I thought that I just said Des had been fired, but apparently I said they'd taken his credentials. And technically they couldn't do it, but within three weeks they did it. And I think that they were under fire and embarrassed. I mean, what was I supposed to say to Fred when I went out? He said, what's happened in there? And I said, oh, they fired him. And I thought I wasn't crying by then, but I was. 
Fred says I was crying. So there you are. That's what happened. So I've just finished on, on this slide, which is not really a summary of what I've done, but the problem with Adventism is of a brand. Experts, historians, say that the denominations who survive are the ones who stick to their original narrative. And I'm sure they take that into account. There are many, many Adventists who would leave if the church took a stand against what they've always taught. You know, they said to the brethren in that Friday meeting, he understood their problem. He said, I know it's it's a big ask. So we, we did understand that it was a very big, that the church would have huge problems changing things. You know, and in the third world, because the missionary the missionaries have gone out have taught people the traditional views. And now we've all got to live with it. So Adventism tends to allow discussion, like at in these meetings, but it always reboots officially to the DNA of its ideas. And many times I've seen it in our time, 1980 and 1983, there seems to be great open, openness and great democracy and a lot of discussion, but actually the ideas, um, what the leadership says before it goes into the open discussion is what ends up happening and the open discussion really doesn't count for much. Um, it's just to make people feel good, really. So Adventism allows discussion, but it always reboots to the DNA of its ideas. It's more interested in tradition and in Ellen White than in the Bible. The doctrine of the investigative judgment is so intricate and often lay people can't follow it. And they trust the leaders and the experts. So the church has made, hasn't made a lot of progress in doctrinal ideas or in social issues like women's ordination. And they tried to handle this recently by trying to mediate compliance from the top. And, you know, it's absolutely inimical, inim inimical or inimicable to biblical principles to compel people. So you can understand the church's problems. So herewith I end my short series. Thank you very much for your patience if you lasted this long.